So let's go ahead and solve this problem. We have a vapor compression refrigeration cycle operating at steady state with refrigerant 134A. Down here they give us the uh, schematic. So you have the evaporator, then the compressor, then the condenser, then the expansion valve, and the flow is going in that direction. So the state one is typically saturated or superheated vapor. State two is after the compressor. So it's going to be superheated vapor. State three is typically saturated liquid or subcooled liquid. And then the expansion valve, it'll be isenthalpic coming down. All right. So the states and the properties are shown. So the states are shown on this layout or schematic. And over here is a table of properties. So we have uh, zero, the dead state, then state one, two, three, and four shown with the pressure, temperature, enthalpy, entropy, and flow exergy. So all the units are shown as well. Um, the dead state temperature is 21 degrees C, so that matches. And the dead state pressure is one bar, and so that matches. Okay, so let's clean that up a little bit. All right. They say the refrigeration capacity is 4.6 tons of refrigeration. So Q dot in is 4.6 tons of refrigeration. And we can convert that into kilowatts. When you do that, well, you can convert it into kilojoules per minute and then also into kilowatts. Either way, um, it'll be 970.6 kilojoules per minute because one ton of refrigeration is 211 kilojoules per minute. And then you can also convert this into kilowatts. Uh, we use it in, in, in that form as well. 16.177 kilowatts. Okay. Ignoring heat transfer between the compressor and its surroundings, so this is basically ignore heat transfer. Same with the expansion valve. You can ignore the heat transfer and work for the expansion valve. There is none. And then determine the rate, the following. What is the mass flow rate of the refrigerant in kilograms per minute? Well, we take a look here. We do an energy balance around that evaporator. And we find that the equation um, will, will give us, let me see where I want to write this, um, maybe right up here. The mass flow rate of the refrigerant, what we're looking to solve, times the change in the enthalpy. It's coming out high enthalpy 1, going in low enthalpy 4, uh, is equal to the rate at which it's heat transfer, you know, coming into the evaporator. It's, it's the refrigeration effect. So it's like this one is given right here. And this is the, probably the best form because you want the answer in kilograms per uh, minute. And so that's known. You have the H1 right here and the H4 right there. So known, known. And because I'm fighting for space, I'm going to say that you can do the algebra and solve for M dot. And M dot is going to come in at 6.0. 098 units of kilograms per minute. All right, let's move on. Part B, isentropic compressor efficiency in percent. Well, we're looking to find 90%. What we find is this is state two actual, and it has a higher S, the entropy leaving the compressor at state two right here. It is higher than the entropy coming in at state 1, 0.9362. So what we have to do is we have to find uh, where the state like 2S, assuming it's isentropic expansion, and then find that H2S so that the equation for the isentropic efficiency of that compressor will be what is the uh, minimum work of the compressor if it would have been isentropic divided by the actual work with some irreversibilities? And so the minimum work would be the change in the enthalpy going from 
state 1 to 2s, so h 2s minus h1 divided by h2 actual minus h1. So it's like we know the inlet enthalpy. This is the enthalpy 1. We know the actual exit enthalpy right there. And so if we can compute that enthalpy, if we assume it was isentropic, then we can now compute the compressor isentropic efficiency. So what do we do? 0.9362 will go to our superheated table for refrigerant 134A. We know that the pressure is 7 bar. We are coming down and looking where 0.9362 fits in. And it fits in right in here. 0.9362 fits right in there. So what we can do is we um, get the fraction of the way between these two values of S corresponding to 30 and 40 degrees, and then use that fraction to get an interpolated value of enthalpy H. Okay, and so when you do that, we find that the enthalpy is at 2S is equal to 2 um, seven zero point four six. All right, a little bit of interpolation, but we've done that before. So it's like we just calculated H two S. It's two seventy instead of two seventy three. So it's going to get an isentropic efficiency. I'm going to just stop right there because I'm running out of space and say that you can finish that and get ninety percent isentropic efficiency. All right. What about the coefficient of performance? the COP, or they use beta or um, nearest text, but I prefer it is COP of the refrigerant. Well, it's what you want. Uh, we want a lot of cooling, and what you have to pay for, you have to buy the power to drive it. So we already are given Q dot N, so we can work it that way, divided by W dot into the compressor. Okay, so what, how do I calculate the W dot into the compressor? It's the mass flow rate times that enthalpy on the exit minus the enthalpy on the inlet. Notice the sign, they're showing us the direction, so we're looking for a positive um, W dot going into the compressor. So um, our H1 is given, our H2 is given, and our mass flow rate we had solved for already right here and actually if you go back you, you can cancel out those mass flow rates this can just be the enthalpy uh, 1 minus enthalpy 4 divided by the enthalpy 2 minus enthalpy 1 and you have all those enthalpies you can co I'm just going to say you can finish that and calculate the coefficient of performance to be 5.04 now the hard part. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about rates of exergy destruction in the compressor and expansion valve, and then the rates of exergy destruction in the evaporator and the condenser, so all four of those components. Well, to solve for these parts, I want to take a slower, longer approach and just sort of organize our thoughts. So I'm going to go to a clean page. And what we can do is I just want to do a little review and talk about energy and talk about entropy and then talk about exergy. All right. So we have a system and we supply some power. So W dot coming in. And the purpose of that system is to provide some cooling. That would be Q dot. You can call it low or Q dot high is going to be up here. Q dot H, Q dot L. Okay. And so for this problem, we found that the power needing to drive the system is about 3.2 kW. All right. And what do we get? Well, you get about 16.2 kilowatts of cooling that matches our uh, 
what was it, 4.6 tons of cooling. I even forgot the number. Yeah, 4.6 tons of cooling. And then what do we have over here? Well, you do an energy balance, and there's no accumulation or destruction or generation of energy inside the system. So what goes in must go out, and you just add it up, and it, you, you get 19.4 kilowatts going out. Now, inside that system, there was an evaporator, there was a compressor, there's a condenser, and an expansion valve. And we had refrigerant flowing in a loop, in a loop, in a loop, in a loop. And what we've done is we can go inside and we can analyze what is that rate of energy transfer for the evaporator, what about the compressor, what about the condenser, and the expansion valve, the same thing. And we can... Um, organize some thoughts on that maybe we put way down here we'll put uh, our component is the evaporator all right then we're going to have a component is the compressor then we're going to have a component is the condenser and then and another component the expansion valve all right and we could talk about uh, what is our q dot into in units of kilowatt and what is our W dot into each of these components. And now for the evaporator, um, depending if you want to add or sum the columns or not, you may want to think about this traditional sign convention. So I'm going to do that. I know that this is a positive W dot in, and I'm going to treat it as a negative W dot in my table, but let's continue on. So for the evaporator, we're going to pick up the 16.2 and there's no power. How about for the compressor? Well, they said it's adiabatic. And what about this? Well, it's it's a negative um, 3.2. All right. How about for the condenser? Well, it's going out of the system. There was our negative 19.4 and there's no shaft and expansion valves no heat transfer and no work. And if you sum these columns, that's one of the reasons I kept the sign convention again, you find negative 3.2 and then negative 3.2 and they have to be the same and that we're happy. That's really not where I want to go. What I want to do is now talk about entropy. Okay, well we have a system and we have some heat transfer and when that heat is being transferred, if we can identify the TB the boundary temperature for that heat transfer, then we can calculate an entropy transfer with that heat transfer. So our equation for the entropy transfers may be like S dot Q. I know I'm making that up. I don't think the book really uses it. I think I've seen the book use it a few times, but it's the ent rate of entropy transfer with this heat transfer, which is just the way you calculate is you take the rate of the heat transfer coming in, and it's the low, so, and we're going to divide by Tb. You could add Tb low because we're going to talk about a boundary temperature on the high side as well. And so for this problem, you look at it for a while, think about it, and you maybe you come back here and take a look. And the, the state 1 is coming out at the saturated at a negative 10 degrees C, all right? And then what is the pressure at 4? The pressure at 4 is um, 1.8, so it's slightly superheated when it comes out because a lot of the evaporator, while it's changing phase, is at negative 12.7. That's a lower temperature, colder temperature. And then it comes out slightly superheated. Okay, maybe I sketched that on a, on a temperature entropy diagram, TS diagram. We have the dome, and we have um, it's the the um, the pressure, the low pressure line, um, giving us for the evaporator like this. Okay, that line of pressure is 1.8 bar. There's another line. I might as well draw it right away. And that line is at 7 bar. 
the high pressure side. Okay, and we just talked about the saturation temperature of the 1.8 bar being negative 12.7 degrees C, yet it comes out at negative 10 degrees C at state one, so it's slightly superheated at one, right there, all right? So that's state one where it comes out. And the question is, is um, this refrigerant in here has to be always colder than the boundary temperature right here, TB. So what makes sense for that boundary temperature? That boundary temperature has to be at least negative 10 degrees. It could be higher, but it's like this is the TB at negative 10 and then on the exit, there's a minuscule or no temperature difference to drive that little bit of heat transfer. In reality, it would probably be more like negative 8 or something like that. But negative 10 is an appropriate boundary temperature. That makes That's a lot of discussion in that. But it's, it's negative 10 degrees C, which when you convert to Kelvin is... 263 Kelvin. All right. So what we just calculated the Q dot, 16.2 kilowatts. We can divide by that boundary temperature in Kelvin, 263. And we're left with a small number if you're talking about kilowatts per Kelvin. But I'm going to make it look larger by talking about watts, not kilowatts per Kelvin. So I move it over by 10, uh, multiplied by 1,000 essentially. And we find what comes in is a 61.51. Long discussion, but this entropy transfer coming in. All right. Can we do the same thing up here? Sure. So we'll talk about the rate of entropy transfer with the heat transfer. How do we calculate it? Give me the rate of heat transfer on the high and divide by that boundary temperature at the high. Well, what is the appropriate boundary temperature up here, TB? All right, well, let's go back and take a look. So what we're going to do is once you go from state 1 to state 2, it'll be hot. It'll be like 38 degrees C. It'll be, you know, way up here, 38 degrees C. But, but most of the condensing occurs at the saturation temperature of 7 bar. And that is really not shown there, but let's go over here and see it. It's 27 degrees, 26, 27 degrees is the saturation temperature at 7 bar. So we'll just say 27 right there, 27 but it doesn't come out at state 3 at 27. If it came out saturated liquid, it would be at 27. But at state 3, it comes out 24. So it's subcooled liquid, just like down here. It wasn't saturated vapor. It was slightly superheated vapor. So it comes out right around here at state 3 at 24 degrees C. So if you're always rejecting heat to something here, the TB has to be lower than 24. Otherwise, you won't be able to continue to subcool down to 24. Now, how much lower do you want the boundary temperature to be right here? Well, I'm going to do an exergetic calculation in a second. And so I'm going to let that help me. I'm going to say that's going to be 21 degrees C, which is 294 Kelvin. Why did you pick 21? Well, it has to be lower than 24. And it's like I'm when I move to an exergy calculation, because the bound this boundary temperature is equal to the dead state temperature. There's going to be zero exergy transfer with that heat transfer. That's why I picked it. Okay, but now we can come up here and say, well, what is that entropy transfer? 
well, it's going to be 65.93 watts, not kilowatts, per Kelvin. Again, we moved the watts just so the numbers are a little better instead of a bunch of zeros. All right, how about this? We had uh, work or power coming in. So what is my rate of entropy transfer with that power coming in? And zero. It's organized energy transfer. There's no disorganization. So what do we tell about this? Well, there has to be some S gen, some generation of entropy occurring within the system. Okay, from an overall balance, we calculate this to be 4.42, and I didn't leave enough room. Let me try and move that. We just calculate uh, inside of here that S dot gen is 4.42 watts per Kelvin. Now, where is that entropy being generated? You go and take a look at this component, the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, and the expansion valve. And you can do that and you can calculate what is that entropy being generated for each of those four components and they sum up to the 4.42 for the net so let me do this i'm going to continue this table down here and we're going to talk about the rate of entropy transfer with the heat transfer into the evaporator into the compressor into the condenser into the expansion valve some of those are going to be zero let's go ahead and do that for the evaporator it's really coming into the evaporator at 61.51. All right, what about the rate of entropy transfer with the heat transfer for the compressor? Well, the compressor has no heat transfer, hence no entropy transfer with it. How about for the condenser? I'm going to revert back to the sign convention and make a negative 65.93. It's positive up here because we're talking about it going out. Okay. How about for the expansion valve? Nothing. So if we want, you do a sum and we find negative 4.42. Now, this is silly, but let me do it. I'm going to put in S dot W. And we say, well, the evaporator has no work. The condenser has no power, no work. The expansion valve, none. And then we think about that compressor. It does have power coming in, but then again, it's it's all zeros but I just put it there to help me think through the process and then we can go and calculate the generation now what you have to do is go in and do a control volume around each little device let's say around that turbine let's go back here and do it for at least one not the turbine the compressor Okay, so if we do a control volume around that compressor like this, and then we do the second law, we find that the um, S gen rate, the rate of S entropy generation, which in our textbook is sigma dot, okay, but that's equal to the mass flow rate, then we have the entropy flowing out at 2 minus entropy flowing in at 1. So we know our mass flow rate, we know our two entropies from our table, and you can calculate it. That's what I'm saying. You're going to do that for each of these components. So when you do it for the compressor, we find that its generation is 1.04. We'll do it for the evaporator. The evaporator is 0 0.60. Maybe I should do it for the evaporator as well. Let me go back and do it for the evaporator right here. So we have the evaporator, okay? And you do an entropy balance, a second law, and um, maybe I should do it in a two steps. So normally we have no accumulation or depletion, so put zero there. Then we have the transfer of entropy coming in with the heat transfer. So that's gonna be the Q dot in divided by the TB. We worked that out already, that's going to come in and then we have the mass flow rate then we have going out at state one minus in at state four 
and then we have the either put s dot gen in for this evaporator or sigma dot your choice for notation but so this sigma dot is taking into account that entropy transfer in as well as the increase in the flow entropy okay so you can do that for the evaporator you find 0.60 units up here are kilowatts per kelvin these are kilowatts per kelvin all right and if you do that also for the condenser it's 1.38 and if you do it for the expansion valve 1.40 if i add those up 4.42 so we can not only do an overall balance of the system, but we can come in for each of the components and find what are the entropy generation for each component, add them up, and they, they, it's a balance. At this point, what we can do is say, well, where is the entropy being generated in the system? Well, if you look at 0.60, you divide it by 4.42, you find that that's roughly 14%. Maybe I don't put parentheses on here. It clutters it up too much, but there you go, 14%. And then 1.04 divided by 4.42, you come right around 24%. And then 31%. And then 32%. So from an entropy balance perspective, you see that you know, you know, this is the smallest here, and these are the largest here for the entropy generation terms in those all right well hopefully that was helpful now let's go not to it we did an energy balance we did an entropy balance we now can do an exergy balance so we have our system and we say we had some power coming in it did not bring any entropy with it but what about exergy is there any flow of exergy with that? And you say, yes, there is. That, um, let me put it like this, EX dot W. So that's like for our power coming in. What is our rate of which exergy? Well, it's a one for one, and it's 3.2 kilowatts. All right. Now, because we picked that the TB up here is equal to the dead state temperature of 21 degrees C, even though you do have some heat being transferred and entropy accompanying it, when you do the exergy calculation, we'll put EX dot with the Q, that will equal to zero. All right. What do you mean by that will equal to zero? Well, what was our general equation? That general equation is one minus the T naught over T B times Q dot. That's our equation for how the exergy is transferred with the heat transfer. And so when the dead state temperature is equals the boundary temperature, this whole thing is one minus one is zero. Boom. It's, it's zero. Okay. Now, when we do the calculations, we're going to find that, okay, we had this heat transfer coming in down here, and it was bringing with its entropy, but when we calculate the rate of exergy transfer with that heat, we're going to find that it's negative, which throws students for a loop, negative 1.907 kilowatts. What? How can you have negative 1.907 kilowatts? Well, let me just think, let you not be bothered too much by the negative sign, but if you wanted to, you could think about it like this. This is our rate of exergy transfer, what we wanted to accomplish of 1.907 kilowatts. It's like I'm bringing something valuable into my system and I want it to accomplish a goal. That goal is to provide cooling at the low temperature. It's like it's providing 
907 kilowatts of what I want it to do. And so it's kind of an out of the system. All right, before we get too carried away with that, think about each of these components. The evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, and the expansion valve. And what we can do is we can think about in, in de detailed exergy balances for each of these, and we can try to make it parallel with the entropy. We can do the same thing with the exergy flow. And that's so we have exergy transfer with the heat transfer, then the exergy transfer with the work, and then instead of an entropy generation, we're going to have an exergy destruction for each of these four components. Okay, maybe I should have uh, also said up here, if you're bringing in 3.2 and you're taking out where you want 1.9, what is the difference? And that difference is, um, let me see about trying to write it right here, that difference will be my exergy destruction rate. And for this problem, you just take 3.2, subtract off 1.9, and you get 1.30. What units are those? Kilowatts. That's my rate of exergy destruction within this system. Okay. Now, let's go and do the detailed. What about the exergy transfer with the heat transfer and the evaporator? Well, it's going to be the negative, let me not change color, negative one, whoa, come on now, negative 1.907, too many digits, but there you go. How about the exergy transfer with the compressor heat? No, there's no, how about with the condenser? We just talked about the, the boundary temperature is the dead state temperature, so there's no useful exergy transfer out up there. And then what about the exergy transfer with the heat transfer for the expansion valve? Well, it's adiabatic, nothing. Same with, let's do the works. Well, zero here, zero here, zero here. Now for the compressor, what is it? Well, you're bringing in 3.2. You could leave it as a plus or a minus. It's, it's for a from the perspective of the compressor, it's coming in, you can put minus 3.2. And if you want more digits, 008. Okay. Well, now you say, what is my exergy destruction rate? I didn't put in here the mass flow times the uh, change in the flow exergy, E sub F. I could have done that because really did to calculate the entropy generation, I remember we went back here and we had to do that. We had to consider what is the change in the entropy. Uh, but let me just finish this out. Um, it, it, you do an exergy balance for the evaporator, just like you did an entropy balance for the evaporator. And you find that the destruction is 0.177. Somebody says, Professor, why are you taking the long route doing an exergy balance? Why don't you just take what you calculated, which was the entropy generation for that device, multiply by the dead state temperature and just put the value there. You're right. You're absolutely right. But you can also do an entropy uh, exergy balance and get the same answer. Okay. So either way, just fill out this column. It's 0 0.305, 0 0.406, and 0 0.412. Okay, I didn't put my units again. What are the units on these? Uh, kilowatt, kilowatt, kilowatt. All those have the same units, kilowatt. Okay, and so when we add this up, what does it come up to? It comes up to our... 1.300 that was destroyed. Okay. And then you can say, well, where was it destroyed? What percent of the of the destruction was associated with the evaporator? Well, it's back to our 14%. Let me not put a parenthesis again. 14%, same percentages. 24%. Uh, 
31% and 32%. And so even though you're asked in the last two parts of this problem to do something which seems to be very tedious or, or a lot of work, hopefully uh, you see it as a nice extension from an energy balance to an entropy balance to an exergy balance. All right, let me go back here. And so basically what I did was the rate of exergy destruction in the compressor, that 0.305 and then expansion valve 0.412, um, 0 0.305, 0.412. And then the last two parts were for the rate of exergy destruction in the evaporator and the condenser, 0 0.177, 0 0.406, 0.177 in the evaporator, 0 0.406. So hopefully um, this was helpful. Um, again, if you want to do uh, the calculation, like this is the second law of balance for the evaporator we can do the same thing let me go ahead and write that out let's do for the evaporator a exergy balance all right so it's steady state and you have an n with associated with the heat transfer so this would be our q dot n using that notation right there and then we don't just divide by tb that would be our entropy balance we multiply by 1 minus T dead state divided by TB. You have to trust the math because that T naught, the dead state temperature for this problem, what was it again? It was 21 degrees C and it's um, 294. So 1 minus 294 divided by TB. That boundary temperature is negative 10 degrees C or 263. Right away, you see, how can I have 1 minus a number that's larger than 1? It'll make this negative. But you just have to let math work itself out. So it's like, even though the heat is being brought in, there's a transfer of exergy out with that heat transfer. Okay, let's continue on. Then we have our mass flow rate times our flow exergy coming um, um, in, but I wanna put, it's like an in minus an out, four minus flow exergy one. We have our flow exergies calculated. Um, there you go. And then we have and um, not an in, we have a destruction term. Uh, subtract off our rate of exergy destruction. And so it's like uh, everything can be calculated, and then you can calculate this rate of exergy destruction using an exergy balance equation. And you, like I mentioned, you can do that for each of the components. Or you can just take and you, you did a lot of work to get the entropy generation multiplied by the dead state temperature, and you'll get the same answer. All right. Well, with that, I hope that was helpful. Thank you.